but there is just nothing that gives us a better picture of the epic battle between the forces of evil and good in the world like Star Wars, right? Now, uh, I don't know about you, but when I was growing up, I kind of thought Star Wars people were nerds. I'm just confessing, right? And, and then I met my husband, and he was telling me, like, Boba Fett's name, like, and he had all the action figures growing up in the 70s, right? And now I have to admit, I have become one of those people. I love Star Wars. I've seen them all. I love them all. And, you know, I remember when my son was little, we took him uh, for the first time to Disney, and uh, he got chosen to be a part of one of the Jedi Club things, and, you know, they, they give all the kids this, you know, awesome lightsaber, and and for a minute, like, he was out there, like, doing the part. Like, he was out there with the thing, and they were teaching the little Jedi kids. And uh, then Darth Maul came out. And, I mean, the dude looked like the guy in the movie. I was scared. And I'm looking at my son, and he's just like, bring him on. Like, he's got this plastic thing in his hand. And he's like, I will take you out. Come on. And, uh, you know, here's the reality. When we look at the world around us, there's no doubt that we see both good and evil, right? I mean, there's a lot of good in the world, right? I just was traveling last week, and uh, how many know sometimes it's just the little acts of kindness that make a big deal? Uh, I was getting on the plane, and I had my carry-on, and I didn't want to, you know, wait in the line, so, like, I packed for eight days in a carry-on. It was heavy, and so, you know, I'm a little bit vertically challenged, if you haven't noticed. And so this really tall guy is standing there, and he sees me struggling to get this thing and hoist it up. And he's like, can I just get that for you? I was like, please, sir, thank you. <laughs> you know, there's, good, there's goodness around. I don't know if you've ever heard of Charity Water. They're like drilling wells all around the world to help people get clean drinking water. Uh, we help Project Rescue, who is rescuing women and children from sex trafficking all around the world. There's so much good happening in the world today. It doesn't always make the headlines either, right? So we got to talk about it because uh, God is still moving. The church is still growing all around the world. But there's also evil in the world. The war in Ukraine is still raging, sadly. Uh, there's still, uh, I was out of town last week, and I was getting news alerts from here, from our local news, about the rash of gun violence that happened last week in a park. Uh, several people shot. Uh, we had no friends that, that lost someone to uh, domestic violence uh, just a few weeks ago. There's a lot of sadness and a lot of evil in the world. Now, when we start talking about spiritual warfare, we tend to make two mistakes. There are those people that, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night and you stub your toe or you run out of gas in your car and it's all just demonic, right? <laughs> they blame everything on spiritual warfare, right? Did anybody know some of those people? <laughs> Maybe some of you are some of those people, right? But the reality is sometimes we just live in a broken world and we make, you know, when I run out of gas, it's just because I forgot to fill up the gas tank. When I stub my toe, it's just because I'm blind without my contacts in the middle of the night and that's just reality, right? Um, but here's the other side. The other side is that nothing is spiritual warfare, and we think that there's no consequence to anything good or evil, and we kind of live our lives pretending that we don't have an enemy of our soul, right? So we can make two mistakes when talking about spiritual warfare. Either everything is or nothing is, right? But we want to talk about in the real world that we all live in that there is an enemy of our soul. There is a Satan, and there is God, right? And, and what does that look like in our everyday lives? Now, a few weeks ago, I was sharing with my pastor and mentor. How many know pastors have pastors, right? So my pastor is uh, Pastor Don Ross, who is our network leader, and I was sharing with him the rash of challenges that I've encountered this summer with our church plant. And he responded, he goes, you know, Beth, that sounds like spiritual warfare. You're planting a church. It sounds like the enemy just is coming against you and on so many levels. 
And he shared with me a message that he shared a few weeks ago about spiritual warfare. And I want to use that as a springboard into some conversations uh, today about spiritual warfare. Who's ready? Um, I've invited some friends to join me at the table. Uh, We've got a new friend at the table, Dr. James Kroon. Come on up. And many of you know Pastor Ariana. And so James is the pastor. Tell us a little bit about your church, James. Yeah, we're Risen Church. We're uh, six years in. We're right now in the Normandy Park area of uh, Seattle. So it's been going really great there. So um, other than that, we're just uh, there in the community trying to do the best we can to try to bring people together to know that they're to come and love the uh, true and living God. So yeah. that's our goal. Yeah, so amazing, yeah. pastors. And your your other job is working for Union Gospel Mission. Yes, I'm the director at the Men's Recovery Program at the Seattle Union Gospel Mission. I've been Wonderful. there for over six years. We're dealing with guys that are coming out of addiction and those who are dealing with uh, chronic homelessness. Mm-hmm. I've been doing that. And then, of course, an adjunct professor at... Northwest University, as yourself are. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah so, we both so I'm teach. A busy, busy person. He's, so. You're not. You're not bored, right? <laughs> I'm not you're bored. Not bored. No, not bored. Well, James, you're yeah. an incredible leader, and yeah. Pastor Ariana has been on our team. She is our outreach pastor uh, here. So she, yeah, give her a hand. She does a lot to reach our community, and uh, so I want to kick us off tonight. What comes to your mind, honestly, transparent, like keep it real, right? <laughs> What comes to your mind when you hear the phrase spiritual warfare? Yeah, I feel like my mind sometimes goes to the extreme, and I just think about those horror movies where people right? get possessed, you know what right? I mean? And, like, their backs are cracking and just all this crazy <laughs> stuff. <laughs> There's some crazy, like, horror movies out there. There's just certain things I will not watch. Yeah, I, I, draw I draw the line. I draw the line at those demon possessions, right? <laughs> I draw the line. How about you, James? Uh, you know, it's amazing. It's like we were just saying before, you know, you have those that overestimate and those right, that underestimate right. it. A good friend of us, um, a pastor friend of mine said they were having a prayer meeting and a person came in and they started convulsing. Mm-hmm. So everybody immediately rushed over, put their hands on him. They're trying to cast this demon out. And someone in the crowd stood up and said, why don't we just kind of ask her what's going on? Well, kind of find out all she needed was her medicine. Yeah, probably. So they put out the money and gave her the medicine. So right. And, right. And, and, you know, so sometimes we can kind of just get to yep. sensationalism in yep. certain things. And then you can also underemphasize that. And when we do that, right. we, we miss the fact that there is a spiritual warfare that is truly happening. Right. That we exactly. deal with on a daily basis. So. That's right. Yeah. So good. So we're going to primarily talk tonight about three places of spiritual warfare that take place. The first one is the warfare that happens above us yep. in the heavenlies. The second one is the warfare that happens here on the earth around us. And the third is the warfare that happens inside of us. So, uh, Dr. Kroon, I always call you James, but yeah, we'll yeah. be formal tonight. James, that's <laughs> Dr. J, Dr. C, uh, <laughs> why don't you kick us off and, and let's unpack where did this whole spiritual warfare idea originate, like in the heavenlies? Talk about the war above us. That's a good question. So if we look at Isaiah uh, 14 and 12, 14, what it actually talks about is uh, Satan's fall. At first yeah. glance, when you first read that scripture, it shows you it's talking more or less about the kings of Babylonian and Tyree. But actually, it, the main focus is primarily Satan, who is the driven force behind that. Right. And it talks about his fall. So in the process of that fall, he did something in verses 13 and 14 where he did five I wills. And that was the reason why he was kicked out of heaven Mm. because of his pride. He said that I will descend onto heaven. I will take my throne and take it above the stars. The next one was that he said that he will be enthroned. He will sit enthroned in the mount of the assemblies. Mm. Then he would be above the stars. And the very last five I wills was that I will be like the most high. Wow. Mm. And so he was eventually at yeah. that point, took, he was shot out of heaven. Now, it's amazing because most people say, well, when did that happen? When did that, that portion happen? Well, if you look in Job 3, it makes yeah. it very clear that what happens is, is that Job, when he was speaking to God, God told him that I had created them before the earth had even came, became formed. Mm. Yeah. And then we have the other scripture where we see that we know that because who was in the, in the garden with Adam and Eve? It was Satan. He was there and he was there right. to tempt them. And then later yeah. we have Jesus speaking to his disciples as he mm-hmm. sends the 72 out. When he sends these 72 out, he gives them all these specific instructions. Yeah. But in those instructions, they came back excited. They were gleeful. They yeah. said, oh, we were able to cast out demons and do all these different things. But when Jesus looked to him, he said, you know, I saw Satan in Luke 10. He says, I seen him when he was shot out of heaven like lightning. So, mm-hmm. so I think I want to hit pause here because yes. what you're saying is that Satan actually was an angel. 
Yes, right? he was. He, he was. was an angel. Exactly. So a lot of us a don't realize that, be, that, that oh, Satan yes. was Lucifer. Oh, yes, mm, yes. And an angel, but he rebelled against God. And exactly. I love how you broke down those yeah. five. And they called, him morning, they called him the morning star. In fact, in the book of Ezekiel, it talks about how he looked. They said when he would walk around and he was in the garden before the serpent, said that when he walked around, he had crested jewels that was inside of him mm-hmm. with gold that was going around that. And he was actually the main cherubim that would actually guard God's throne. Wow. Mm-hmm. He was the most beautiful angel that could be seen. And wow. that was part of why he came to the point of the rebellion. So right. interesting. It's very interesting. And then when we get to the point of Revelations is where we start to look at where yeah. the big change came when we talk about the battle. Right. So when we go to the book of Revelations, it says in, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's Revelations uh, 12, right. actually, where we're there. It's also talking about John. John actually sees a vision of mm-hmm. The, of, of right. the war that is going on in heaven. Now, it's amazing because when we look at this war, what we start to see now is that we, we, many people are wondering, when did this war happen? So this spiritual warfare. Well, we have to keep in mind that we do know that when he made that fall, he still had access back and forth to heaven. We saw that in the book of Job, that he was able to stand before God and try to accuse Job. Right. In Zechariah, he's standing before him trying to accuse a man by the name of Joshua, who was a priest. Yeah. So he mm-hmm. had access. But the one that was in Revelations was the main war. That was the spiritual warfare war. Mm-hmm. Now, when that happened, he was expelled. He was not able to go. Right. But now I want us to understand something. When we talk about spiritual warfare, it actually still was a war going on from the fall all the way up until this time. Mm. But that was the great spiritual warfare battle that yeah. had happened at that time. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing because when we look at that, what it talks about there is it starts to talk about where did this all take place? Well, we know that the heavens is actually three places. Those three places is really amazing because it takes it's like a Lord of the Rings type of thing when you look yeah. at it from that standpoint. Yeah. Because uh, actually, Paul mentions that that there's a def- different heavenly realms where they all preside. So the first realm is the heavenly realms is around the earth. You have the clouds, and then after that, you have outer space or the, st- the stellar space that's out there. In fact, when you look at the stars tonight, you can look at it and know that if you really look at them, the stars in the Bible, it always talks about the angels being what being stars, mm-hmm. and that is where the war is happening. So tonight, when you look at the stars, you can just think mm-hmm. about the wage of the war that is going on that we're dealing with each day mm-hmm. of what those stars look like. Yeah. And then we know that the very last one is where the throne of God sits. It's in the, third, in the third realm. And now through all of that process, we have these angels fighting in outer space. They found from space down to the clouded area, but they cannot go up top. Mm-hmm. So this war goes on, and of course... They lose yeah. this battle. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's amazing that we have to understand that that spiritual warfare that's going on there is still the same welfare, warfare mm-hmm. that we deal with here. And we see that many times even throughout Scripture yeah. because there was times where Daniel was so depressed for three mm-hmm. weeks and he was wondering where would he get his help. The angel Gabriel came to him and said to him, he mm-hmm. said, I would have been here, but he said, I was held up for 21 days fighting against Satan and mm-hmm. his angels. Mm-hmm. And Michael, the archangel, had to help him in order wow. to do that. So there's many instances sure. where we see the spiritual warfare going yeah. on. So yeah, it's, it's amazing when we start to look at that. So now I want to look at it from this standpoint. So how, how, how does acknowledging Mm -hmm. Uh, that there's a great battle between good and evil, and it impacts how we live today. How does it impact us today? Right. That's a great question because, I mean, maybe you're hearing all this stuff, and you're like, what is this guy talking about, you know? (laughs) Like, how does this impact my life? (laughs) Um, I mean, It's a lot of stuff. (laughs) Yeah, it is a lot of stuff, and it is important to be aware of. And I think of it like this. Like, if there really is a great battle for our souls as individuals, you know, and as humanity, like, if we're not aware of it, it's going to be like going into a fight with a blindfold on. Like, you're just being hit from every direction, and you're just ignorant and defenseless because you don't know what's going on. You don't know what the realities behind these forces of good and evil are. I think we even see that struggle in humanity. Even, like, you know, us as a culture and us as a society, Mm -hmm. like, even the whole world Mm -hmm. is just struggling with, like, how we deal with evil, how we cope with evil. Are people good? Are people evil? And it's just a big, confusing mess because we don't know about these forces, you know? So I think that really helps in our struggle with with evil in the world and in ourselves to know what's actually going on. Yeah. You know, it's been said that we can't conquer what we don't confront, right? Mm. That's good. So if we don't acknowledge that there is an actual spiritual battle going on, we're not talking about fairy tales, right, and myths. In fact, back in the 70s, there was a singer named Keith Green, and he wrote a song from the perspective of Satan and saying, I I can basically do anything because nobody believes in me anymore, Mm. right? And so if we don't acknowledge that there really is evil, that there is an enemy of our souls, and that's reality. Like you said, it's like we're fighting a battle with a blindfold on. I love that analogy. Yeah. It's so good. That's awesome. Uh, I want to 
we're going to move this over to uh, how do we fight the spiritual warfare that's around us? Yeah, right. That's a great question. And um, I love how Dr. Kroon talked about, man, there is this big eschatological battle going on between good and evil, but that has also affected our present reality and human history. Mm -hmm. Um, So there is a warfare going on around us. Since Satan and his angels have been cast to earth, it makes sense, you know, that we would be affected by that, right? Right. Because we also live on earth, so we're occupying the same space as it would. Um, So this war isn't just above us. It's here in our everyday lives. And as we talk about this more, even if this is a subject that maybe you're confused about or you're you're not super open to, we're going to talk about how this affects us as individuals, and that's what I'm really excited for in this sermon. Um, But I think something just for now before we get to that part um, is just to know that Jesus has conquered Satan and that Jesus has conquered evil. So even though we're we're acknowledging this, it's not something that we can be overcome by because we have the power of God within us. And, you know, just because there's evil in this world, um, we can know that Jesus has the authority over that evil. And Mm -hmm. I think that's something really encouraging that we can all just carry tonight as we learn these truths from the Bible. Um, But even though that that is a reality um, right now, Satan still believes that he can win. He has certain powers in this earth, um, just certain um, things that he can do to make us stumble, um, Mm -hmm. to make, you know, just the world a worse place, um, Mm -hmm. just to kind of combat Christ's authority. Because just like if we look at the beginning, what, like, how was Satan, like, made into what he is now it was from pride it was from rebelling against god you know so that's what he wants for this earth for society for you as an individual he wants whatever way is not god's way is what he wants for your life so whether it's just those little deceiving things like being addicted to your phone or those little addicting like you know being greedy or something just those little things can like chip away and like make you rebel against god in fact that one scripture i'll just jump in here the Mm -hmm. scripture says satan his objective is to kill, steal, steal and destroy. destroy. Yeah. Right? Mm-hmm. That's, that's like in our lives. Like that's his his goal for each one of us. So yeah, yeah. no, it's so true. And I think there's so many ways that you can see it in your life, um, where Satan can just get a foothold on something, even like you know. Um, self-depreciating thoughts or something like anxiety. And maybe though he didn't cause those things, but he can just Mm -hmm. cling on to those things for your demise. Um, But I think another thing that we need to remember today is, um, I'll read the verse later, but that our battle is in the spiritual realm and it's not in the physical realm. And we'll explain a little bit more what this means, but we are an army that gets to spread Christ's love and hope and message and gospel in this world. And we're not an army of oppression or violence, but we're an army of hope and compassion. So whether you knew it or not, you're in a battle, but you're also in an army. Right. And you know, who are you fighting for? You know, are you just like floating in this world, open to any kind of attack that the enemy may bring? Or are you really like an art, like a soldier for Jesus, you know, in, in by way of spreading his love and compassion, his message, you know? Um, and, um, this area of warfare that I'm talking about today, like I said, in Ephesians 6, 12, Mm -hmm. It says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil Mm -hmm. in the heavenly realms. Yeah. So there is such a big truth that I think we can grasp from this message. We're not intended to fight against people, but we are supposed to fight for people. That's good. And man, (laughs) say that again, Ariel. Yeah. Okay. We need to hear that one again. I'll tell you, (laughs) Uh, we are not intended to fight against people, Mm. but instead to fight for people. Wow. And you know, you may be sitting in church on a Saturday and be like, "Um, duh. Like, right. You know, I'm not trying to get into no wars, but here's what I'm saying: there is so much division in our country that. You know, it's caused by so many different things, by politics, by Mm -hmm. racism, Mm -hmm. by political ideologies. Um, And, you know, but the fight is actually against spiritual principalities. It's actually against spiritual evil. These things are things that concern us. They should deeply concern us, these, like, wrongs in the world. But the way and the perspective that we are supposed to be taking isn't to fight the people who look like are against us. Like, for instance, if you have yeah. a different different political opinion from someone right. else, like, they are not your yeah. enemy. That's right. Instead, like, we should have the perspective of this is a person that I want to love yeah. and invite into God's kingdom, into God's family, yeah. Yeah. Um, for his purposes and his will. It's and so good. instead, we should be like, you know, there is, like, a certain spiritual darkness about racism that needs to, like, That's be right. eradicated from this world, right. you know? And the only way to fight that is not... Um, 
is not aggression, but yeah. instead is just um, by the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. and by love, compassion, so and reconciliation, good. you know? That's good. And that's the kind of fight that we're in, Yeah, you know? And, and bringing it down to the real world, just yesterday, uh, I was here all day, mm-hmm. and uh, a few ladies came in, and they were looking at some of the things that we were doing, and uh, one was really sweet and excited about what we were doing, and one just picked a fight. She wanted to pick a fight with me. About she, what? She was arguing. She didn't like who was sponsoring our food, uh, Chick-fil-A, because she said they had a different views on things than her. And I said, well, isn't it beautiful that we can have different views on things and still kind of get together? But she just wanted to kind of argue. But even in my heart, I was like, you know what? I'm not going to fight with this lady. She is not my enemy. Right. right. Yeah. And we can get that perspective. Right? Like, you know, the news wants us to be polarized. It's profitable yeah. to be polarized. Yeah. But instead, you know, we need to be agents of love that's in this right. world because that's what's actually going to change the world. Yeah. I'm um, talking like Michael Jackson, you know, <laughs> got to see you changing yourself. Um, but since we're not talking about a physical war, you know, there are different different weapons that we need to be equipped with. Since this is a spiritual battle, we need right. to figure out what are spiritual weapons that we can use. Yeah. So we all know that Luke Skywalker in Star Wars has this lightsaber. looks pretty right. powerful. Right. Um, and David uses a sling and a stone to defeat Goliath. Yeah. Esther used her favor within the kingdom to change a nation. Um, different battles require different weapons. And in 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6, it says this. I want you to listen here because this is one one of the most powerful verses that we're going to read tonight. For though we live in a world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are Mm -hmm. not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power Mm -hmm. to demolish strongholds. Mm -hmm. We demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Mm. And we will be ready to punish every act of disobedience once your disobedience, once obedient, once your obedience is complete. Yeah. So um, like this verse says, we are not going to wage war like the world wages war. Mm -hmm. You know, in that Facebook comment, when you're getting pretty heated, you don't need to talk back to them just like they would to you. Because in the same way that we're not bringing violence, we're also not bringing hate. You know, this can be like to a actual, you know, Mm -hmm. real life thing where you're not going to bash someone else's opinion or like, you know, call them this or that. Like we're actually going to try to approach people in love. And that is the kind of you know, weapons that we want to use and utilize. Yeah. And um, spiritual warfare is just the opposite of the world. Mm -hmm. It loves the enemy instead of killing them. Wow. And I love that. Wow. Killing them, being, you know, being negative Mm -hmm. towards them, hating them, all of these things. And that is what we're called to as Christians. And that is what can actually win the war, you know? That's incredible. So I want to ask you guys, um, how are the ways God wants us to fight different from the ways people fight each Mm -hmm. other? Kind of how good. spiritual warfare different from physical warfare, That's pretty good. much. James, what would you so say? if we look at it, well, we know that it's physical. So if we're right. talking about people, uh, we're looking at Hebrews 12 and 14. It says, strive for peace with everyone. Mm. That's good. That's I good. think many of the times that when we have problems with other people, we don't look at the driving force behind the actions yes. of other people. Yes, yes. There's been many situations where, like, for instance, the lady that was arguing with you. Right. The, the main thing is, what is driving that? Right. What's behind her? Right. Great question. Right. See, what's driving behind a person is that's the thing that's really something that you need to focus on. That's it's right. not the individual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Many times, even people that we come in contact with, whether they be believers or are not, are non-believers, a lot of people are dealing with things in their life. May it be sin or mm-hmm. dealing with uh, different things. Nobody just wakes up in the morning and says, you know what? I think I'll be a jerk today and just <laughs> right. get on right. everybody's nerves and annoy <laughs> people. Right. I don't think anybody does that. If they do, that's you know but typically what happens there's something going on in someone's life and the thing that we have to do we have to look past who they Mm. are and that's Mm. where we begin to pray and say whatever is driving them that's what Mm. we need to focus on so good that is the key now this is a good one when we start talking about how do we fight with spiritual warfare (laughs) and you're dealing with satan i'm going to give you guys the number one tool don't get in the ring Mm. that's good don't Mm. get in the ring yeah the bible says to resist him Yep. That means you stand firm in God's word. That's in First Peter 5 and 8 when it talks about that. It means Amen. stay strong, mm-hmm. stay vigilant. Right. And it says to make sure that you stand firm against them. So the yeah. number one thing is don't get in the ring. It's like proactive. It's exactly. Right, you know? Because right. you don't want to do like most people to say, you want to talk to them, you want to say mm-hmm. all these things to say. No, mm-hmm. don't talk to them, mm-hmm. don't deal with them. You stay firmly within, yeah. within God's will and stay within his word and walk in his good. precepts and his commands. And that is what's going to cover you. 
So that's the best way to do it. So that's if you, good. You, you learn anything else, don't get in the ring. Don't that was solid. Ring. Oh, my goodness. Y'all can leave tonight. <laughs> right? Drop the mic right there. So, you know, I love what you said, you know, looking at people's intentions. Because yeah. often we know hurt people hurt people, right? Exactly. So if yeah. somebody's yeah. hurting you. I can guarantee you they're hurting. Exactly. So even when that lady wanted to pick a fight and argue with me, I wasn't going to get in the ring with her and no, argue with no, her. I was just no. like, hey, we're here loving people. We're here just, you know, serving the community. Um, but even Jesus said from the cross, God forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. And he was yeah, like dying, yeah. right? <laughs> can you imagine? Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine? But, you know, I think the thing that I think of when I find myself in a conflict, I need to stop and pause, right? First of all, we all just stop. You know when you feel your your blood pressure rising? You know that feeling? Like, I can physically feel it. Yeah. Like, when somebody says something, I'm like, <laughs> ooh, I, I feel something happening. If we just pause and say, what do I want the end goal to be in this conversation? Do I want to hurt them or help them? That's, that's good. Now, and I have to check my motivation sometimes because... Yes. Yeah. yeah, because God flips the script, like you said. You know, most battles, we want to defeat the enemy. But Jesus flipped the scripts and says, no, I want you to love your enemy. Yeah. Right. And that's yeah. contrary to how we typically respond, right? That's true. Because we want to check people, and we want to prove ourselves right, and we want to prove something, right? Yeah. Uh, but God says, no, uh, I, I want you to help them, not hurt them. Right. So. It's good. so yeah. countercultural. And that's yeah. one of the things that I love about the Bible and about Christianity. If you're just getting into this faith, it is so interesting because some things just align with what people love, like, oh, yeah. kindness. But then other things just seem to not make sense. Right. And, but God just, with his power, helps it be true. Yeah. You know, yeah, so and I'll good. talk a little bit more about that. For instance, in 2 Corinthians 10, 4, it says the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the mm -hmm. contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. So yeah. I want to talk about the spiritual weapons we wield. And when I talk about what is countercultural, what we mm -hmm. think of as a weapon is like, you know, a knife, some pepper spray, a taser, <laughs> right. something pretty effective, you yeah, know, something yeah. that... In all truth, we'll hurt somebody when That's we right. use it, right? Right. Um, but the weapons that we talk about in the Bible for spiritual warfare, which are, you know, just as serious as physical warfare, right. are actually so interesting. You know? You know what the Bible says? You know what it says is a weapon? This. Yeah. You guys see this? This is paper. It's even thinner <laughs> than paper. This could burn like like nothing. Right. But this is what this is what the Bible says is yeah. our weapon. It calls That's it a right. sword. Wow. You know, that the word of God is so powerful. It is God's divine words that can yeah. defend us against lies of the enemy. That's that right. That can defend us against yeah. um, right. false perspectives and yeah. false words against wow. us, our family, society, humanity. Like, wow. this is what is powerful. This is yeah. what we should be wielding. And that means memorizing it, having it in your heart, getting yeah, to know it. So good. It's good. And that's how we can defend, yeah. you yeah. know? That's how we yeah. resist the devil. Yeah. Yeah. That's how Jesus that's right. resists yeah. the, the devil when that's he right. was tempted to um, yeah. give into the devil's schemes, when he was tempted after 40 days of not eating. Jesus quoted scripture. He, yeah. he quoted the Bible, it's Satan, to withstand that all temptation. Three times he did. Yeah, that's all right. three times. He did not that's stop. Right. That's Jesus right. had to get in the ring, yeah. and he yeah. used his own words. Yeah, yeah. That's um, right. <laughs> it was. It was so beautiful, so powerful, and that's what we're called to do wow. in our lives. Yeah. So that is the main spiritual weapon that yeah. we get to wield against the enemy of our souls. You know, yeah, you know, it's just real quick, Ariana. Do you see that it's, it's really, it's really fascinating that Satan was kicked out of heaven because of his pride mm -hmm. and wanting to be God. Mm -hmm. Right. And if you go throughout Scripture, everyone that he tempted, he uses that same technique. Right. When he spoke to Eve, he did it in a subtle way. Did yeah. God really say? Yeah. Do you know that you can yeah. be like him if mm -hmm. you do this? Wow. When he came to Jesus, he said the yeah. same thing. He took him to a high mountain and had him look mm -hmm. down and say, you can have all of this mm -hmm. if you worship me. Wow. And right. So he, he always has the same, and he does it to us today. Yeah. This next point, I think, is going to be so impactful because we're going to talk a little bit more about how um, spiritual darkness and spiritual light can affect us. So, Beth, could you yeah. tell us more about that? Yeah, well, I think the spiritual battle hits home. We, we've talked about the warfare that happens above us, around us, mm -hmm. but now we're going to really hit home and talk about the warfare inside of us. Mm -hmm. right. So, you know, the war that rages is in all of us, right, which all of us can say, uh, that we wrestle with, it's the great equalizer of all humanity is temptation. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Now, who in here can say, I have never been tempted, right? None of us can say we have never been tempted. We have all been tempted. Scripture says all have fallen short of the glory of God, right? And it's a, it's a tension that is kind of like a tug of war, right, in our mm-hmm. souls, right, that we wrestle with. And, uh, you know, I know I should eat the salad, but the chips just taste better, right? <laughs> uh, I, I know I should hit the gym, but that yeah. movie, man, uh, it's so much more fun sitting on the couch, yeah. you right? I had to look at my wife about the uh, chips. So, yeah. I said that because Pastor James, had, he, he follow him on social media. He'll show you how to, how to lift weights and, you know, not just spiritually grow stronger, but physically. He'll, he'll, he'll t- teach you a few things. Um, you know, I know I should love that challenging person. But, you know, avoiding them is just so much easier, right? Mm -hmm. You know, it's that tug of war. Mm -hmm. If you've ever seen the old cartoons and even some of the newer ones, we see it depicted even as children, right? Mm -hmm. We see cartoons where, you know, somebody's making a decision and there's a little angel on one shoulder, right? And a little red guy with a pitchfork, you know, on the other one. Uh, If you've ever seen the Emperor's New Groove, right, it kind of looks like this. Um, We all have this spiritual battle that happens in side of us. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know if you've ever seen that story, Mythbusters, where they kind of just take some myths and they and they kind of correct them. I want to talk about three different myths about temptation. The first one is this. A lot of us can believe that temptation itself is a sin. That, that's kind of a myth. Anybody ever feel tempted and you just feel guilty like you've already done something wrong? <laughs> yeah, right? that's true. That's true. I remember when my son was little. He had one of those guilty conscious. I could look at him across the room, you know, and give him that mom look, you know, that look. Beth can do the mom look. Yeah, the mom look, <laughs> right? And the kid would just break down crying, even if he hadn't done anything, yeah. right? I remember, Maybe those, he, I remember those looks from my mom. Right? So yeah, but, yeah. but I could tell he was thinking about doing it. I could tell he was being tempted, right? Oh but But Scripture says... Temptation, and I hope this sets somebody free today. Temptation in and of itself is not a sin. Right. Jesus was tempted, right. and he never sinned. Yeah. Jesus was tempted yeah. Uh, yeah. in the desert in Luke 4. But listen to this scripture in Hebrews 4, 15. It says, for we do not have a high priest, the high priest referring to Jesus, right, who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one, referring to Jesus again, who has been tempted in every way. Just as we are, yet did not sin. So just because we're tempted doesn't mean we're sinning. It's what we do. It's the response. So here's the second one. The second one, uh, anybody ever think, you know, God, you're just test- tempting me, right? God, you, God, why are you tempting me? Well, temptation does not ever come from God. He doesn't want you to mess no, up. You he, know? Doesn't want, <laughs> he doesn't want to dangle something in front of you just to, right? Now, there's a difference between testing and temptation, right? So let's break that down for a minute. Every good teacher will give the student a test, right? Nobody thinks that your teacher is evil because they give you a test, right? I don't know, man. Some teachers. <laughs> Some teachers got that evil streak, right? James 1.13 says this. And remember when you are being tempted. Somebody say when. 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 Not if, but when. When. Do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Now, isn't it easy just to blame all of our problems on other people, right? Mm -hmm. Blame it on God, blame it on somebody. Mm -hmm. Uh, But we can't blame it on God when we're tempted because the root of temptation is not in him. In fact, Mm -hmm. the root of temptation, if we look in verse 14, says this. It says, but each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed, right? That's true. So when we, you know, there's just problems in this world that we can blame on other people, right? I remember uh, many years ago, my kids were just little. Brenda was just a newborn. Uh, Somebody broke into our house. In fact, Greg and the kids were home. Oh, my goodness. And they broke in, and Brenda was sleeping right there. They took my husband's cell phone, his wallet, all this stuff. Now, I can point at whoever broke in and said that is their fault, right? Uh, they, they got issues. Like, you shouldn't be breaking into my house, right? But when I'm tempted, the only person I can be blaming is me. I got to look in the mirror and say, you know what? It's kind of my own evil desires. There's, there's some pride, right? Yep, there's some yep, pride going yep, on in me. Yep. There's some maybe doubt. 
Yeah. Doubting that God has something better for me, yeah. right? Yeah. Doubting God's goodness, thinking I have the answers and God mm-hmm. doesn't want something good. But scripture talks about God being a good father mm-hmm. that wants good things for yes. his children. Mm-hmm. Um, but here's the good news, and here's the third one. A lot of times the myth is that certain temptations are just too much. They're just too much. It's just too overwhelming. I, 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 it's I, impossible. Right? You know? yeah. Like yeah. what's that one chip commercial can't have just one? Is that Lay's? Lay's. Yeah, Lay's. Lay's, yeah. It's true, though, right? <laughs> no. But, but, like, they're trying to tell us you can't just eat one. Mm-hmm. Right. I could eat one and walk away just to prove them wrong, I right? Can, I... And you know why? <laughs> because we all have a free will. Right. Right? The, the greatest gift God has ever given any of us is a free will. Mm-hmm. I can't make you Amen. do anything. You can't make me do anything, right? God has given us this beautiful gift. We have freedom of choice. Uh, James 1.14 says this, these desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, say allowed, allowed. it gives birth to death. Mm-hmm. So what we allow to grow in us gives, will give birth to it. Now, the question is, what are you feeding? Are you feeding you know, the goodness, the, the godly desires in you, or are you feeding, you know, the, the other desires in you? And by the way, tests and temptation, you know, God does test us to make us stronger. And he tests us to give us perseverance. Uh, but temptation is, is from the enemy. Uh, a test builds our faith, but when we give in to temptation, it does lead to sin, and sin eventually leads to death. Uh, and, and the reality is, let's be honest, when we give in to sin, it feels good in the moment, right? Let's just keep it real. If no, it didn't true. feel good in the moment, you wouldn't do it, right? right? That's so true. Yeah. I just kind of want to bring it down to real life, right? We, we kind of want to keep things real here at the yeah. table. How do you deal with temptation in your personal lives? Mm-hmm. Hmm, that's a good question. The way that I deal with it is I have to be transparent with God and transparent with others. Mm, That's good. That's That's the way that I do that. I know it's typical for us that when we're going through things and we're saying, okay, I'm going to pray to God and say, God, please, Lord, just just take this from me. I hate doing this thing. And and you're telling him all this. You can't come to God and lie to him about what you don't like because you wouldn't have done it if if you didn't like it. Yeah. The best way to come to God is say, God, listen, I like this thing and I need you to take yeah, this from me. That's good. I need to not like this because I know mm. it opposes mm. for everything that you stand mm. for. All actions, all actions that we take mm. to sin begin mm. with a thought. Mm-hmm. You know? That's true. That begins with a desire, yes. you know, a little thought in our mind. Oh, like, what if I yeah. did this? Or just a thought about it, you know? Right. So if we can, you know, make all of our thoughts obedient mm-hmm. to Christ, That's I good. think that we can avoid so much sin in our mm-hmm. lives. Mm-hmm. Because if we just so stop it, you know, pull it out of the roots when we yeah. first see it, mm-hmm. man, how will that affect our spiritual so lives, powerful. you know, our mm-hmm. actual lives, emotional yeah. lives? It will be incredible yeah. when wow. we can learn how yeah. to control our thoughts and give them over to God. Yeah, yeah. 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 the battlefield is in our minds, right? It, it all is. starts there. Anybody ever been to one of those escape rooms, right? I, I worked with a team once that did these escape rooms, and they're, they're kind of a fun team-building activity, unless you are claustrophobic. Uh, they lock you <laughs> all in a room, right? They lock you in a room, and they say, there is a way out, but you're going to have to find all these secret clues and you're going to have to kind of look around and one clue leads to another leads to another and you're usually in competition with a time limit to see if you can get out but here's this god always provides a way of escape yes, from temptation does. always check this out first corinthians 10:13 it says no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to mankind and god is faithful He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, right? But when you are, there it is again. Say when. When. It never says if. You notice that? (laughs) It never says, hey, Ariana, if you're tempted. It says when. When. So when you are tempted, here it is, he will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. Mm -hmm. There is always... A way out. And Jesus made a way out of the battle above us. And when he died, he took the keys That's of right. sin and death. That's right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Truly. And Jesus has made a way out um, for the battle that's going on in this world. That he has conquered death and that we have a promised home in eternity where evil, where sin, and where death are absent. Yes. Amen. And Jesus, he made a way out for the battle that we deal with every day with temptation. 
We can acknowledge and be honest, like yes. you said. Yes. Keep it real. You know, I often say to people, you can fool me, but you can't fool God. Amen. You Amen. can fool me. Amen. But you can never fool God because he knows your heart. He knows the motives and the hearts of man. And yet he always provides a way of escape. You can always call up somebody and say, hey, I'm struggling with this. Will you pray for me before you take a step of action and do something, right? Mm -hmm. uh, some of the, the and I believe the scripture talks about confessing. It says, confess your sins one to another so that you may be healed. God Amen. wants our healing, and often it's that, tran uh, that transparency yes. of yes. saying, hey, I'm struggling with this, for us to be free and truly healed. 